What we're aiming to do is explore that notion of collaboration, that idea of working together, uh, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet effectively, in order to achieve net zero goals. COP26 stated that governments, businesses, civil society, they need to work together to transform the ways we power our homes, our businesses, grow our food, develop infrastructure and move ourselves and goods around. So, with that in mind, we've invited a group of experts from different fields all to sit together to consider if collaborative work is indeed the way forward in order to solve the climate crisis. Is it feasible? And if so, can it be achieved? What are your priorities? You're an activist. Um, I sense the frustration that we heard from Claire there. Uh, but she didn't just say it was a climate crisis, it's an ecological crisis. How would you address this? All right, thanks. It's a great segue. Um, so the question, Extinction Rebellion is, is far from perfect and with humility, what's unique about us is that we've been willing to fully face what this crisis is and to feel the deep grief and despair that that leads to. And then we set out to tell the truth um, using the, the specific methods of non-violent civil disobedience. And rebels in the UK are willing to risk much to speak the, this truth and have it be heard. Though this sacrifice is not comparable to those uh, made by our family in resistance in the global south, of which over 200 people die annually trying to protect their land from the ravages of this chosen global economic system at the heart of the problems that we face. So we want to collaborate with any economists and their professional bodies who are willing to tell the truth about the problems baked into our economic system, even and especially if it means moments of career-limiting actions when you speak out. I'm a trained physical scientist, but I've also spent years studying economics, encouraged by so-called heterodox economists like our dear professors uh, Molly Scott Cato, Hajun Chang and Steve Keen, who've encouraged ordinary people to understand that economics is a political discipline and not largely a form of science. So the data is clear. You cannot have continued economic growth on a finite planet because the destruction of the biosphere is coupled to GDP. And only partial decoupling is ever evidenced. We have to stop this monster of infinite growth. And there is, according to scientists, a widespread view that warming of our planet by four degrees will result in the collapse of our civilizations. And yet, we have an economist, William Nordhaus, who is given the so-called Nobel Prize in economics for saying that four degrees of warming is optimal. We have a major issue in our economics, folks. The economic modeling underpinning this work is based on integrated assessment models using estimates of damage functions and future discounting. But natural scientists estimate these damage functions have been 20 to 30 times higher than those from economists. And there's this huge gulf in understanding of climate tipping points and representations of climate catastrophes. Uh, the Royal Economic Society had Professor Nicola Stern saying that economists had also misunderstood the basics of discounting and thereby were undervaluing the lives of young people and future generations. So, folks, we've got this clash between physical and ecological sciences and the free market fundamentalism, the economic growth fetishism of a specific branch of economics that's captured our system because it's in service to the rich and powerful. What is considered economically and politically unrealistic, such as calling for degrowth, is completely different to what is scientifically necessary. The life support systems of our home planet are breaking down and reaching tipping points of no return. And it's physics and ecology in Gaia that will have the last say. <clears throat> so Professor Steve Keane, who's thoroughly debunked this appallingly bad neoclassical economics of climate change has said, given the impact that economists have had on public policy towards climate change and the immediacy of the threat we now face from climate change, this work could soon be exposed as the most significant and dangerous hoax in the history of science. 
So when activists like myself question the economic system, we get labelled, it happened yesterday to a colleague, as anti-capitalist. I just think that's a trope for naive, anti-business, anti-markets, anti-progress and uninformed. The labels used to divide and discredit at a time when we need to listen to each other to apply imagination and determination together to make change. We need a grown-up conversation about economics. Nobody wants to throw out any babies with the bathwater, right? So I'm here to lean in and imploring those of you with powerful voices here, and including and especially the Royal Economic Society, to speak out. We're one family and we're called in these times to speak truthfully and work together in collaboration to enable the vast and rapid changes that are so desperately needed. Thank you. Wonderful, girl. Thank you. We know there's an emergency, but how do we do that without having to wait seven years for each can, individual thing? Can I give you one example of a policy that I think... So, so I think you need to see the system and then you need to conceive of policies that will operate right across the system. So I'm a huge fan of the carbon tax for this reason. Because if, if you introduce the carbon tax upstream, it would put a price on the production of CO2 in every single company and activity across the economy. So it would increase prices and it would be necessary to, to use the revenue to then support people who were paying higher prices. But to my mind, it's a very good example within a market system of a policy that that then works, you know, it filters down and it works right across the economy. So I think you need to have a systemic understanding, but then you need to introduce concrete overarching policies that create the right incentives to make the changes. That's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for an effective policy. Gail, do you want to reply to that? Well, I, I think you have to look for um, levers in the system because we, I, I don't think we have a functioning democracy, so you're not getting leadership on this issue and people aren't speaking out, which is why it's really contingent on everybody in every place that they can to, to, to be really truthful. When we talk about what's um, feasible, we have to bear in mind that we're talking about the collapse of civilization. We're talking about people not having enough food to eat. Mm. Um, we're talking about people's major cities across the world being flooded. It's quite hard to get your head around the apocalyptic nature of what we're facing. Um, and when you don't have leaders speaking the truth um, within a system that's just sort of self-perpetuating, we've got, we've got really big problems. So it does make a difference when... Uh, people commit sort of acts of civil disobedience and our XR social scientists launched recently and they said what should we do and I said um, sorry but I said go and occupy your economics department <laughs> because not, not uh, and it's not, not, not nothing personal <laughs> to uh, any of the economists here I don't know anything about your your, your own personal work um, but there's not a strong enough message from the world of economics about the the Problems like like Molly being called mm. a heterodox economist, right? Mm. If your economics is not about the environment, it's nonsense, right? So you know that's what I think. <laughs> My question is simply: How can economics change from being part of the problem to being part of the solution? Okay, girl, you were doing mm. something. You were nodding there. Um, yeah, I th what I like to say in, in in response to that question is that there are there are sort of moments when People say the emperor's got no clothes on. Mm. <laughs> and when it comes to economics, we need bodies like the Royal Economic Society to play that role now. And um, I would like the Royal Economic Society to declare the fact, and, and economics departments, to declare the fact that the current political economy is destroying life on Earth. I would like them to say that we can change our economy with wisdom and imagination um, in a way that will regenerate the natural world. And specifically, I think uh, we need people to speak out against this uh, Nobel Prize for this awful work because it's not, it's not some stupid thing that happened on the side. It's, it, the, 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 these integrated assessment models are being used by the Bank of England to, to, to talk about how we should finance. It's mm. nonsense, folks. You just scratch the surface. With, uh, the, a, a physical scientist, uh, Professor Kevin Anderson, said of economists. He said he prefers to call them astrologists and he says it's okay for them to be using page numbers, they sh shouldn't be using any other numbers. I mean, like, that's really, really bad, isn't it? If, that, if your profession has been talked about that by climate scientists and um, so point out that the emperor's got no clothes on. Another piece is the journals, right? The journals, about, look at what's in, the, there's barely anything in the economics journals about uh, climate and ecological uh, change. That, 
we need to t change from things like cost-benefit analysis mm. on whether life on Earth survives, right? We're, we're close to a Permian mass extinction event, folks. We're talking cost, but it's nonsense. Risk mm. opportunity analysis make more sense. And then how are we going to finance this? Again, you know, modern monetary theory should come to the heart of, of, of modern economics. So nobody should be called a heterodox economist. You should be heterodox if you're not uh, a green economist, you know. Everybody else is heterodox, because what are you talking about? And I, I, and I, th I, th I think that um, that moment of speaking the truth um, and calling th and naming things with... We're not, we're not talking about blaming and shaming. We're talking about kindness <coughs> here, right? That's that, but I'm making specific requests to the Royal Economic Society. These, these institutions are quite conservative, and we haven't got time for that now. We need people to be really powerful. Well, that might be one to take offline after, after this. Um, how do we get the international community to get on board, well, of what we're perhaps not doing, is Germany, as Molly says, Germany seems to be doing it right at the moment, but how do we all sing from the same hymn sheet and, and, and get together and, and work out a proper plan? So, I mean, Gail, will you, will you unpick some of that as well? well I think it's a really interesting question, even this idea of incentivising things. Um, Pat McCabe, who's an amazing um, indigenous teacher and leader, says that humanity has got low self-esteem right now. We think that everything that we touch, we break. Um, and it's not like that. It's because we've signed up to a certain paradigm. We're behaving in a certain way. People, human beings, are meant to be keystone species. We're meant to make the world more beautiful. That's what we've done um, as peoples in the past. And we're living in a system that makes us behave badly. It's not by accident that people think they need new clothes, right? Um, 650 billion annually spent on advertising dollars, right? I mean, it's a, it's a propaganda machine that we allow to happen. People... Uh, we, we have different uh, people in our heads, actually. The neuroscience makes this clear these days. You have the sort of wounded, uh, worried person on your left hemisphere, and the right hemisphere is uh, more visionary and, 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 and associated with empathy, creativity and playfulness. Um, and there are, there's, a way, there's a way in which we need to get the Western civilization out of our own bodies, the way it's showing up. Um, and actually, what I've discovered is um, a really uh, strange way to incentivise people is to go and break their window. Um, I'll be uh, in court this uh, month twice for breaking the window of the Department for Transport and the window of Barclays Bank. And what uh, I've experienced, um, and I heard Greta Thunberg talking about this as well, behind the scenes people come up to you and they thank you for what you're doing. They know that it needs to happen. A head, a head of sustainability of a bank said that the breaking of the windows was making her job, their job easier. Uh, the person who was a former vice uh, chairman of a major high street bank said that what we did was correct. But, I think it's but fair, they won't say it publicly. I think it's fair, fair to say, though, Gail, with all honesty, that, that may be the case, but there's lots of people that you, 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 you get the heckles off as well because that, they course. don't think that's the right way of to course. proceed. They understand your principles, that they don't think that's the way you will get people on board. Well, I mean, you know, this is the theory of civil disobedience, right? Is you're not here to be liked and you're here to get the conversation to happen. So I, I can tell you that sitting in the European Parliament, when Fridays for the Future and Extinction Rebellion rebellion started up. The stuff that I was being laughed at for proposing, suddenly everybody was proposing it. I, I could sit there and notice the power shift. So, um, yeah, everybody can get irritated about the individual actions, but it has been politically powerful. And, you know, I really congratulate XR for that.